mean, I played in a band for years. You know, I, um, I that's how I got into film. Is I was a drummer in a rock band, and I wanted a music video for a band that we could shop in L.A. and blah blah blah. And you know, I ended up being a filmmaker that works on the opposite side of the camera. And you know, luckily I get to still play music. You know, but one of the reasons I got into film, um, like I said, I, uh, I started off as a musician, was is that it combines all my favorite things. It's I, to me, film is the most powerful medium because it's got, you know, it's you're telling a story just like you are with a song. It combines music, it combines photography, it combines acting and theater and everything to a very powerful medium that people see in theaters, they see on TV, they see on, on the, online now. It is probably, you know, if you want to make an impression or if you want to tell a story or you have a point to make or whether you just want to make people laugh or you want to make them cry or you want to do something really profound like Michael Moore does every time he makes a film, you know, film is, is, is the most powerful medium. Um, because it combines all these forms of art, you know. Um, I yeah, I, I feel really lucky that I get to be really involved, um, sort of like Robert Rodriguez is with his pictures. Um, you know, this one I happen to co-write as well, but as a, as a, as a cinematographer and director and producer, um, you know, I hired myself to score the movie with Joe, <laughs> and I'm also editing it, and I'm going to be playing in the band Rolling Thunder. So um, it really, I, you know, as a director, it's great because not only can I put on my stamp on the film, you know, I'm being involved in every aspect, but I seriously think um, I can't remember what I was telling the other day. I see, I see myself as a, a director's as sort of like a conductor because you're not acting for your actors, and a lot of the times there's nothing you can say other than be supportive, you know, to help them with their performance. You're capturing their brilliance, you know. So you're sort of leading them in the right direction essentially. Um, so I see myself as more of a conductor than a director, if that makes any sense. Um, so I also see it as sort of a quality control thing, because as a director, you know, you have so many things that weigh into the equation of making a film. You know, the music, the editing, the, in this case, animation, visual effects, that you have to just make sure that all of that stuff fits perfectly and dances together and, and works at the end of the day because if it doesn't work it's your fault that's that's the director's main job is to make it work you know? I really did grow up with a, like a, a rock and roll background um, most of the bands I played in were either speed metal or grunge to just straight rock and roll um, although I grew up listening to punk and new wave you know, because I was very much an 80s kid, even though I was born in 1974. The hip-hop, yeah, I just really didn't listen to hip-hop very much, but I always liked it. We did some tracks on Intoxicating with Send Dog or Cypress Hill. And, um, you know, I just remember in high school, um, I guess the Insane in the Membrane was the... the uh, he was the guy that went, insane in the brain, you know. And I thought, God, I can't believe we're going to have this guy on one of our tracks. And we got, it's funny, I found out through a mutual friend um, that um, Coolio and Sendog had always wanted to do a track together. So we did two tracks with them. And it's really cool because what we did is we combined, um, I've always been into combining different genres. Um, Coolio said it. The beat sounded a little like hip hop meets red hot chili peppers, which I thought was strange um, because it was a little faster than most hip hop stuff. And, uh, you know, he did 16 bars and, and uh, Send Dogs uh, did 16 bars. And then it breaks down in the middle to this sort of uh, really beautiful ambient Middle Eastern vocalist. Her name is Azam Ali. I can't remember the name of the band she's in now. But she has a very beautiful, like, Lisa Gerard type voice. And I've always loved combining things like that. So they're very strange track. I mean, like, you wouldn't hear this on a hip-hop station. This is something unto itself. It's a little bit weird. It's a little bit faster. It's like a, um, you know, it's not what everybody... I mean, rewind for a second and go back to um, um, what Cooley was saying. We did another track with him and a couple of other artists, Sendog being one of them. Um, Neblove, that used to be part of the Warren G 
outfit, the five footers, um, and it's a, it's a lot more typical hip hop. You know what you know is more hip hop than, than the track I'm talking about. Die for me is what it's called. Um, and then um, you know we even did some some pop stuff, a little bit of pop stuff, and um, the uh, the most hip hop of all the tracks is the one we did with Mo Prem, Shakur, and um, uh, Medusa. And it's called Blow Your Mind, and it's just really, it's just it's like a gangster rap, you know. Which is strange, because I'm so not from that world, but it's music, you know. And I didn't write the words, well, I just wrote the beat, you know. So it's so funny, I mean, you hear about, like, you know, uh, people having these, like, you know, so I, I, so I think uh, Dr. Dre may have a ghostwriter, and he was, like, some scrawny white dude, and that, that's, like, what, um, uh, Hustle and Flow was based on it was that, that 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 concept, which is funny because you know I, I recently I've been uh, someone just gave me a Jack Kerouac script to read and um, he was really good friends with this this big gigantic bass player guy um, I can't remember his name Paul something Ron Ron something um, that he you know towards the end of his days Jack Kerouac would go into this bar and and uh, hang out with his buddy Ron, who was a bass player in a band. At the time, the guy was doing something really interesting and integrating, because this, you know, this is still segregation back then. He was integrating, he had a, a band that was part black, part white, which was like not heard of back then. And he goes, it's sort of like a domino. It's like, uh, it's like mostly uh, black, but a little, a little white in there. Um, and I thought that's really interesting, because um, one of the things that Kerouac said um, was that um, uh, Ron always used to say that uh, music is blind, you know? So, which is a cool thing, because you think about how Elvis, you know, basically copied blues, Led Zeppelin copied blues, um, and then how, you know, rap started off as a very, you know, African-American oriented sound and then like you know Eminem comes out you know so it's it's really cool how music just sort of you know integrates and reintegrates and, 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 and flowers in a, way, a weird way like that it was really interesting um, working with Coolio specifically because he was very open to the idea of trying new stuff because he heard the track and he's like hmm yeah this is different cool let's put it down you know um, and um he was very into the idea of trying something different, whereas some other artists that we worked with said, you know, uh, can I do this other track instead? I don't really like this beat. You know, we're like, yeah, sure, we have other ones too. Um, the cool thing that Coolio did, um, not only was he experimenting, but he, yeah, we learned a lot from him. He would say, okay, now I want to double my vocal, double this part. Um, just, you know, throw a little distortion on it, I'm going to do some, you know, background stuff. Um, and he sort of directed us, like, this is how I want to do it. And we were so happy to accommodate that because not only did we just fly through the session, he nailed it and he was awesome. And